And by the way, anyone who's listening, if there's someone that you perceive that you want a relationship with, for the love of Christ, don't ever ask them, could I pick your brain? Could I take you to coffee? It is 100,000% disrespectful of that person's time and it is disrespectful for yourself and you're not gonna make it anywhere with that kind of attitude. What's going on, everybody? I'm Chris Noggle, and welcome back to Money School Podcast. Today, this conversation is going to be a good one, and I'll tell you why. This gentleman, Will, is a good friend of mine. I know him through the masterminds, but he is a mover and shaker. But he's doing something really interesting in a space that is that is a lot of people are in this space, but he found a niche and he's going to go after that. And that niche is something that all of you need to pay attention to, because if in your business you are surrounded with other people, competition, other people that want to do more than you find a niche, find a way to get ahead. But what also is really cool about Will is his story and my story have one very cool similarity, Wall Street. So let's dive in, folks. Get your pens and paper out or just put your thinking cap on because this is going to be fire. Welcome <laughs> to the show, Will. Thanks, Chris. I appreciate it, man. It's great to be here. Absolutely. Well, hey, listen, I, I know a lot about your past. I know about your Wall Street and the time you spent there. And, and I know about what you do today in the wholesaling space, but you're also doing something really unique. And I don't want to put the spoiler out there, but before we get into your wholesaling business, your 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 business failures, we're going to talk about failures, folks. We're going to get into how Will built a business up to $7 million and crashed and burned. Oh yeah. Come to, yeah, we're going to talk about how that happens so you folks know how not to ever let that happen in your business. But we're also going to talk how he rebuilt himself from the ground up and has built another empire, but an empire built on strong foundations because it's a niche that is so underserved that he and his company get to solve a really freaking big problem. And I think it's exciting to talk about. But Will, tell everybody a little bit about yourself and your journey because it's just it's a wild story. Yeah, man. So first things first, thank you for the, for the awesome introduction and thanks for having me. Um, so I, I went to college, um, I'm first generation Cuban American, uh, single mom and you know, the American dream was go to school, get a degree, go get a good job. Right. Um, that's what I was told since I was a little kid. That's exactly what I did. Uh, I went to school for finance, graduated top of my class. I was one of the only recruits to Merrill Lynch from a school that Nobody really knew about in Miami. Um, I got to Wall Street. I had an internship. I got hired. Um, I was a junior trader for oil and you know commodities, and I was learning the business as I go. Uh, my dream was always to be on Wall Street. You know, I was the kid that watched all the movies, and I wanted to go there. And the streets were paved with gold, and I wanted to hustle my way to become rich on Wall Street. And you know, it turns out that wasn't how it worked out. But uh, hey, but, Will, yeah. real quick. What was your favorite Wall Street movie of all time? Wall Street with uh, Gordon Gecko. Love yeah. it. All right. Man. I, had to I, I still have there. a frame of him, Michael Douglas, back there. That's greed that's, is good. Greed is good. That's right. <laughs> uh, Blue Horseshoe loves Anna Cot Steel. That's right. I love it, man. Charlie oh, Sheen yeah. does such a good movie. Yeah, dude. I watched it. My girlfriend and I watched it a few months ago, and she had never seen it. She's like, "Oh my god, this is amazing!" I was like, "Babe, this is this is gold. This is what it is." Uh, this is pretty much what the eighties was built on in wall street, but, uh, but yeah, man. So I did that and, um, I worked there for about a year and some change and it was awesome. I mean, as you know, working extremely long hours, uh, a lot of stereotypes, right. Bottom of the totem pole, um, coming up, I was against a lot of Ivy leaguers. I was not an Ivy leaguer. I do not come from money. Um, I got a scholarship. I busted my ass, worked a couple jobs through college. Uh, that's how I got through college. And, you know, when I got there, um, Wall Street was I've always been in situations where I, I don't want to say I'm the odd man out, but, you know, the odds are definitely stacked against me. Right. And and I think that adversity is great. I actually I enjoy adversity. I look for it. Um, I thrive in it. Uh, that's just me. And, and it's always served me well. So when I got there, I graduated from FIU, which really is not a big school, uh, certainly not Ivy League, and certainly wasn't pumping out, you know, finance wizards, right? 
So I got there and all these guys and girls were from Columbia and Dartmouth and, and Yale and Harvard. Right. And I'm meeting all these kids cause we were all kids. And I'm like, man, these people are, these, these people are sharp, you know, number one, number two, it was totally different. Uh, the tenacity that I had versus them. Like for me, I knew I was like, all right, I, in my mind, I was like, all right, I was given a shot here. I earned it. I better not mess it up and let me really, you know, like these kids had something to fall back on a lot of them. Right. They had big money families. They had connections and stuff like that. They had a beautiful degree from Harvard. I didn't. So I was driving from a totally different place. I was always earlier. I was always staying later. I was always working harder. So I knew very early on that, hey, my work ethic will will make me shine. And I and, and as I have ambition today, I mean, I had a lot of ambition back then, too. So long story short, was there for about a year and some change. Did not get along with a with a superior or a boss of mine. Um, his name was Jay. He was a dick, for lack of a better term. And uh, he pretty much told me, I'll never forget. He said, "Look, you need to stay in your lane." Um, and I said, well, I, "I don't know what lane that is. I mean, we're on a a six billion dollar hedge fund." Uh, I thought, you know, I thought this was it, right? I thought it was like kill whatever it was, and 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 let's progress. I mean, I'm 24 at the time. So anyway, that, that kind of caused some static and long story short, he's like, look, either you're going to leave or I'm going to fire you. And I said some nice, not nice things back. And I walked out and that was that. So moved back in with my mom, flew back down to South Florida. My mom was going through a divorce at the time, which was, you talk about a shit show compounding. I went from living in Manhattan in a little apartment, but I was living in Manhattan and I was like living the life that I wanted to live back home with my mom. Um, and when I, when I walked in, you know, my mom being Cuban, she, she looked at me and she's like, well, what are you going to do? And I told her bluntly, I was like, I will never work for anybody else ever again in my life. And she was like, well, that's great. You better figure it out. <laughs> Cause I didn't come to this country for you to be a bum. <laughs> that's, that's all she saw, but she supported me. And she said, whatever it is, you can do it. And she always believed in me. And she's like, you're a very sharp kid. Just get out there and do it, whatever it is. And and dude, long story short, man, I, I started listening to podcasts. I was putting out bandit signs for a buddy that had a diabetic testing strip business. So the, uh, imagine I'm a college graduate. Wow. Yeah, dude, I, I'm a college graduate living in Manhattan, get fired. Now I'm living back home with my mom. She's going through a divorce, so it's not a good environment, right? And she's going through the ringer. I am now putting out bandit signs at night for buying diabetic testing strips just to make ends meet because I hated corporate America so much. And all the while during the day, I was listening to podcasts and I had gone to a Tony Robbins event with a buddy of mine, Jake, and shout out to Jake, we're still friends to this day. He took me to Tony Robbins Business Mastery. And in that event, I actually got to meet Tony for a little bit and talk to him because he was a platinum uh, mastermind member. And that, that event changed my whole life, man. And I met a guy there um, Jeff, who that was the first time I had ever heard about wholesaling. And he said, you need to follow this guy who was Sean Terry. A lot of us know, and he had a podcast and flip to freedom. And I heard a podcast with a guy in Miami and, um, I heard it about three times while I was driving, putting out bandit signs. And I called him, I called his office. I lied to his secretary and I got on the phone with the guy. And the first thing that, you know, I was on wall street, you know, so you're good at being on the phones. And the first thing I said, I was like, listen, you don't know me. I don't know you. But if you teach me everything you know about this business, I will pay for the marketing and I'll split my first five deals with you 50-50. And it was a moment of silence. And he said, can you come here tomorrow at 11? And I said, yeah. So 91 days later, did five deals and it was off to the races. That was 2017. Wow. You know, I hear that a lot about Tony Robbins events. I mean, no, no yeah. matter who you are, I, I, I think you'd have a hard time shaking a fist at Tony and being like, ah, it's all fluff. Because so many people that go through that have what they define as a life-changing moment. Now, I have never gone to Tony's events, but I promise you it's on my bucket list and I will do it. But I love that you mentioned that because like you had a fire, you just didn't have a direction. You're putting bandit signs out for something that now today, I'm sure bandit signs were a part of this next phase of what you were doing, but you learned it doing it for diabetic testing. So- yeah. You know, like some of the cool things that I think are important in your story that I want my audience to catch on is 
even when things don't go right in your life, even when a door gets slammed in your face, it's for a reason. You were meant to have that door slammed. You were meant to get fired. You were meant to be told you suck because you were on the wrong path. But yeah. what you learned on that path was a necessity for you to get to the next step. And that's what I think a lot of people don't do. They fight all through life thinking that everything's you know rigged against them. It's only rigged against you because you think it's rigged against you. It's all in your mind. The rigging, the, the bad things, the failures, they're preparing you for what's next, which is the greatness. And, and you actually saw that, whether it was thought, you know, whether you saw it during that time or not, it doesn't matter. You didn't let that bring you down because you could have, you could have just been like, this sucks. I'm just going to, I'm just, you, you could have went down the wrong path. And so many people yeah. do because they lose sight of the bigger goal, the goal that we I always call it the worthy idea. So, so you got with this guy and it was from a podcast and you literally put it all on the line. You said, here's what I'm going to do. This is the risk I'm going to take. This is what I'm going to give you. And I think that's honorable. And I got to say, there's a guy in my office, Dimitri, and I'll never forget it. We used to run a RIA here and I'm up front speaking. The meeting ends. I'm about to step off. He stands right in front of me and he's a Russian kid. He stands right in front of me and he says, are you hiring? And my answer immediately, because it's always this, is I'm always hiring, but I don't pay anything. <laughs> he, didn't, he didn't step out of the way. He said, when can I start? And I'm like, did you hear me? <laughs> I'm always hiring, but I don't pay. He said, I heard you. He said, I need the wisdom. I need the knowledge. He was young, 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 young kid. That kid today, that Dimitri never stopped working, never, ever asked for a paycheck still to today has, and I've thrown him money on a bunch of stuff, but he now runs a big construction company, tons of employees, does all my work. And he's still flipping houses and building his own portfolio. And he just hit a milestone. He bought his Porsche Cayenne for him, his wife, and his new baby. It's just like, like Good for him. Dude, that's the thing. It's so relative. And I love that you did that. You just said, I don't care. I need to learn. So what happened next? Yeah, so what happened next was we we did five deals in about 91 days and you know so to to preface that second what you said um I didn't have any money. So your 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 viewers are probably wondering, well how the hell did you do the marketing and how did you get started? Well, I had one Bank of America credit card that had a $30,000 limit. And this is how committed I was and Again, I don't know any other way, so I tell this story till this day. Um, I bankrolled it all on a credit card, and I didn't care. If, if, if I had to stop paying the credit card because it didn't work, that didn't even cross my mind. I just said, this shit's going to work because I'm going to make it work, <laughs> and that was it. So you know, some people call it burning the boats, whatever it is that you want to call it. I didn't have a plan B. I wasn't going back to corporate America, so that was it, and I believed I was starting to real, read about you know Napoleon Hill and Think and Grow Rich and stuff like that. So I was like, all right, well, if I believe enough and if I put up enough effort, the universe is going to send something my way. Um, and it did. But of course, it wasn't clean. You know, My first deal ended up in a lawsuit for a year, which sucked. I didn't even know what the hell I was doing. Your so first that, deal? That was, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It was, it, was, it was a list pendants with a specific performance. I mean, I didn't know what to do. My mentor at the time didn't even know what to do. He, he hadn't dealt with that. And that was the first contract I got. It was a sign. It was like a 35K assignment. All the money in the world to me at the time. And then it ends up imploding. So could have quit there. Could have never started. Could have quit there. Kept going. Um, for the next year and a half or so, uh, my ex-partner and I, we ended up just bouncing around, figuring things out, cold calling, you know, a thousand dollars a day. Um, doing whatever door knocking, I mean, whatever it took. Right. And, and just learning old school, like OJT on the job training, this sucks getting smacked in the mouth every day, learning, listening. Um, I align myself with, um, a really good attorney who's still my attorney till this day, Gus. I walked into his office one day, about a year and a half into my journey. And, and I sat with him and I said, listen, I want to go to the next level. I know you've been in this business for 23 years. Who can you connect me to that I can learn from and I can just pour massive amounts of hard work and value into that person? And he said, and I never, I get chills even telling the story. He said, you know, you remind me of someone that sat in my office 10 years ago um, and his name is Ray. And, and I say, well, great. Get Ray and I on the phone together. Where is Ray now? I hope he's not dead. And he's like, he's not dead. 
He's still an investor and I'm going to connect you guys. And that led to probably 14 months of working with him. That guy taught me a lot and he got me to the seven figures and my mindset. Again, ended up splitting 50-50 with him for about 14 months. But the knowledge that he instilled in me and taught me got me into my path into becoming a millionaire in, in that regard and got me out of like, oh, this is a hobby into, wow, this is a real business, KPIs, marketing, direct mail, et cetera. So, so that was the next phase of my journey. Um, you know, fast forward a couple of years, we, we ended up scaling um, to 7.9 million was the year that we did. Um, one year of assignment fees, which was 2020 to 2021, late 2021. Um, which was a booming year for everybody, but we really capitalized off of it. Um, then I ended up selling, this is the crazy part, uh, big lesson here. I ended up selling a third of my business to an investor slash partner that, that came into our business. And he legitimized us. And the only reason I did the deal is because he sponsored us on the commercial banking level. And we were able to get a million and a half dollar line of credit. So now we were like in the big leagues, right? And we're thinking, wow, like our business is real, you know, for wholesaling and flipping, typically banks don't like us. They don't like to give us lines of credit. They think we're high risk, right? Whatever. So now we were able to capitalize off of things, but that ended up imploding. And that third partner, we ended up in multiple lawsuits and that was just a shit show. Um, and then, you know, we, we fixed that, but we had taken so much damage that our business was, you know, we went from 27 employees down to like six. And then my co-founder and I, about six months after that, ended up parting ways as well. I ended up buying him out. So now I was like at a fork in the road. This is about 18 months ago, 16 months ago from, from today. And I was a fork in the road because I'm like, man, I've done over 500 transactions, a lot of litigation, sold a piece of my business, bought it back, bought out my third partner. Now I'm alone in that, in that regard. And I'm like, all right, I don't have any partners anymore. I don't want any partners. Like I'm, I'm, I'm done. I've matured a lot. I did a lot of self, you know, soul searching, if you will, discipline. Um, I was partying a lot at the time. I, I don't even drink anymore, as you know, but like, you know, I just, I, I really got centered and I got serious about it. And, and I realized like I had so much potential and I had always been very successful in whatever it is that I applied and no pun intended, but I have incredible willpower. Right. And, but I never had real self-discipline and self-control in a lot of things. And I, and I was always, I, I delayed gratification, but never enough. And, and the second that I started making millions of dollars a year at 30, you can imagine, I was like, well, <laughs> I'm going to have a good time. Right. So I did that, but it, it came at a high cost. So then I reconsolidated everything, man. And I started from, I don't want to say the ground up, but pretty damn near close to it, back to where I had hit Everest, if you will. And I was the top two biggest wholesaler in the state of Florida, um, second only to uh, the late Oliver and, you know, who passed away from, uh, from property force and all that. And dude, you know, I, you said something earlier where you said like things happen for you and the universe puts things in front of you and success leaves clues. So during this whole rebuild phase, a buddy of mine asked me to speak at, at his event in Miami. And I'm going to tie all this in together. But I went to go speak at the event. It was about 200 people. At this time, no one knew who the hell I was. I was not on social media. I was never in the public light. But I had done a shit ton of deals in South Florida. So I speak up there about the topic was scaling and how I got there. Fine. So I, whatever, I spoke for about 45 minutes. I get off the stage. I get mobbed by a bunch of people, you know, asking you questions and stuff like that after the fact. And I started noticing a trend, which was about 15 people came to me with a very thick English accent. You know, they, it was broken English. And then I switched into Spanish, which is my first language and their eyes lit up. And now they're like, holy shit. I had no idea you were even Hispanic. And I'm like, yeah, I'm Cuban American. And now we're having conversations and these people are like, can you teach me this? Like, like, how do I, you know, how do I get more of you? How do you know, do you, do you do any Spanish coaching? Do you do any Spanish teaching and this, and content or whatever? And the light bulb went off for me right there. And, and I was just like, man, this is such an underserved community and they're great people. They have a lot of cash. I mean, they're very hard workers, but all the while there's hundreds of gurus in English. So they can't digest that information fully. 
let alone people in South America that have money. They want to get into real estate. They would love to buy assets in America, but they don't know how. And they don't even know that it's possible. So, or that you could do it virtually. So that led me on my journey to, you know, starting an education company specifically geared towards Latinos and stuff like that. And, and, and really owning that space, being one of the first to do it, if not the first, you know, Spanish course, Ameri- you know, English course. So I, I teach bilingually, which, which is a really cool position to be in because it's the first that I've ever heard of for anybody to be able to do that. So that opened up a whole blue ocean of opportunities and stuff like that. And then I was able to rebuild my business doing joint ventures and helping people with deals and people would bring me problems and I would fix them. And then boom, we would make money. And that got me back into scaling out my own team again. And now I have a team of about 10. They're amazing. You know, I I scaled the business back the right way and very tight knit. Um, You know, that business is probably doing two and a half mil a year, which is great, you know, within a 16 month span to bounce back like that in South Florida, which is a very competitive market. So that's kind of the, 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 the full story in a nutshell of how I got here today. Your real estate business lives and dies by the network and the connections that you make. I mean, after all, your network, well, it's your net worth. That's what you've always heard, right? If that's an area where you desire improvement, well, Private Money Club, it's for you. PMC saves you precious time and money by bringing the real estate world, well, right to you, right in the palm of your hand. So get in on the action like so many others have by going to privatemoneyclub.com and sign up. One of the things, you know, when you talk about South Florida being a very competitive market, especially in the wholesale and real estate space, it's ridiculously competitive. But really, like what you just talked about, this niche serving Latinos and doing it, you know, both English and in Spanish, like bilingually, like that is not being done. And I can't believe it's not being done. I I, honestly, as you're saying this, I'm sitting there kind of thinking the same way I thought when I came up with the idea for private money club, like somebody has to have done this. I mean, come on, it's obvious. Like this is such a, an underserved thing. Somebody has got to have to have just created this. And, and I found out nobody had, and you did too. You're like, you know, somebody has to have done this, but I like you don't know anybody doing what you're doing. And the Latino market is huge. I mean, it just, just your natural market in South Florida. I mean, I, I think you could probably flourish just in that market, but like, what if you took that nationwide? Like how many more people can you help change their life? And all they need is just a path. Somebody yeah. that can show them in your journey, the ups, the downs, the failures, and all the lessons, one lesson, folks, I want you to pay attention. Maybe you forgot it and, and didn't really hear him, but it, it really was heard by me. He was talking about how he was giving 50% of all of his business up to the people that taught him, to his mentor. You know how few people would do that? People would feel entitled. They would feel, oh, I deserve more than that. They would they would literally start putting walls up and start saying, no, no, I'm doing all the work. I deserve this. But you didn't. You you understood. There's, a, there's universal laws, folks. Yeah. You can't change laws. Try it. Go to the top of your building and jump. It's called gravity. You <laughs> will lose because laws are not bendable. And the law he's referring to with that, the law he learned is giving. He just gave and gave and gave and just kind of kept going. I relate. I can't even begin to tell you how much I've given. You you gave 50%. Like now what I know today sitting here, I'm not going to even say it, how much I gave to my mentor, but it works out to be millions and millions and millions and millions of dollars. And you know what? There's not one second of any day of my life, same thing with yours, Will, where I regret doing that, where I start thinking, oh my God, he took advantage of me. No, it was the greatest thing ever because because of giving, because of all that I received first in knowledge and in wisdom. And then after that, I received the greatest gift. And that was the ability for the student to become the teacher. Well, your story's identical. You Mm -hmm. gave and you gave and you gave and you took it on the chin and you learned first knowledge, then wisdom. And you, the student became the teacher, but you didn't just become the teacher. You became the teacher to a unique niche that is so underserved in this country that honestly, it's sick to even talk about how underserved the Latino market is in almost every capacity, even my business. It is severely underserved. And the fact that you went out there and you're doing it in the way you're doing it, there's no way you can't be successful. Period. And not only that, then you're doing deals with the students to show them the real path. You're solving their problems, which is, again, feeding the universe. <laughs> Dude, it's 
It's amazing what you've done and how you figured this out, but your journey, and I'm glad you went into detail, was full of holes and falling on your face and literally going from a $7 million business to like having it implode. And Mm -hmm. and lawsuits and fights, and most people would just have given up, but you had that tenacity, as you mentioned, and that's what's gotten you here. And you'll have more failures as you go through this journey, but each one you know is just the stepping stepping stone to the next. And and it's you know, here folks, like you're you're listening to Will on this podcast. And folks, I'm just gonna pause and transition real quick. I urge all of you to go to Willie Numbers, super easy to remember, willynumbers.com. Check out what he's doing. Follow him on Instagram. He's he's all over social media now, even though he never used to be. He is now. So we'll get more into that in a second. But willynumbers.com. Check that out. But one of the things I was I was really kind of going into is, you know, everything that you have done in this journey, you know, really could have never been possible if it wasn't back to that door slamming in your face. Imagine that. Imagine that you just stayed in that hedge fund. You were pond scum for that hedge fund and you would have remained pond scum for the better part of probably five years, but you you kept doing that. And that guy didn't dislike you and didn't treat you like shit and didn't say, I'm going to fire you. Imagine what would your path be? Maybe it would have been a good one, but would you have been passionate about that being pond scum and then just be one of those, those individuals, the, the Ivy leaguers, but you're not the Ivy leaguer. I mean, would you ever been, would you have been accepted? No. Yeah. I, I, I mean, no one, no one knows. Um, I, I could tell you that I wouldn't be the person that I am today. That's for sure. Um, just going through everything that I, that I went through. Um, look, there's a lot of lessons in everything that I, that I had happened for me. That's the biggest lesson, right? It doesn't happen to you. It happens for you. Um, the day that you, you take control of your life and stop that victim shit, that's owning your life right? Why did this happen? You know, a lot of things happened to me uh, or for me that I, I really self-imposed, right? I, I gave people a lot of control over what I had built. Um, and that, you know, comes from a lack of self and, you know, worth and getting distracted and taking your eye off the ball and getting cocky and ego and arrogance, et cetera, et cetera. And it was a long journey back, you know, a lot of self reflection, a lot of work. And, you know, the, I quit drinking just because not that I ever had a problem with alcohol, but I realized like this is getting in the way of me processing all the stuff that I need to process and learn and apply to get to the next level. And if, it, you know, I got very, very, very early on in my career, I, I knew I fired all my friends, you know, from high school when I, when I got into my career I, and then, and then I did it again when I got into the entrepreneurial journey, um, so very quick, I'm very fast with things like that. I, if you're in my way, very similar to you, a progression, you're out. There's just no conversation. It doesn't make you a bad person. It's just, we're not heading down the same path. My bus is not your bus. I'm out. I'm continuing, right? Energy bus is a great book, by the way. It's a simple read, but it really is. You know, people bring certain energy onto your bus. Either it's good energy or bad energy. I talk about it, deposits versus withdrawals. Is someone in your life making deposits or is someone in your life making withdrawals? If they're making more withdrawals than they are making deposits, you got to cut that person out because you're going to overdraft your account, right? And that's a very simple way to look at it. And I know a lot of people are like, oh man, that's harsh. What about the good people? I, I'm not talking about good or bad here. I'm talking about your progress and how bad do you want to get to wherever it is that you perceive you want to go to. There's going to be a lot of tough decisions along that road. And I know because I personally had to make a lot of them, most of them with myself. You cannot negotiate with yourself. If you say you're going to do something, do it and do it well and do it even with, you know, when it's hard and when it sucks and when it's cold and when it's rainy and whatever, you know, anyone can do anything when the conditions are perfect. I mean, I, I think it's hilarious. I used to think this way too. People would show up and the conditions are perfect and they're like, oh yeah, I had a great day. It's like, no shit. Conditions were perfect, right? Tell me what you do. When there's a shit show going on in every aspect of your life, what do you do then? How do you handle that then? Where do you bounce back? Tell me what you do there. That's why I I personally believe all the people in my life, yourself included, have been through a tremendous amount of adversity and difficulty. Those are the people I want in my life. And, you know, David Goggins talks about who do you want in your foxhole? Those are the people I want in my foxhole. I don't want a guy that's going to drop his rifle and run in the opposite direction because he's soft or a girl, 
right? My girlfriend knows this too. She's been through a lot and 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 so have we and we've built what we've built. So I think it's it's really getting down to the bottom of where it is that you want to go, make some decisions, make commitments, figure out, hey, how far am I actually willing to go to get there? Um, good or bad? And and am I willing to accept that and do it for a very, very long extended period of time that may seem like an eternity before you see any results, right? And 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 go out there and do it. And if you're not, cool. You have figured out that you didn't want what you thought you wanted that bad. Move on. And 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 that's a sad truth, but not nobody likes to talk about it. Nobody likes to hear about it. But it's true. I can't tell you how many guys I started the business off with that now are coasting, that I blew past them. And I'm not talking about just financially, but mentally blew past them. And they're still doing the same shit. It doesn't make them bad people. But then they look at me and they're like, well, I wasn't like you. You know, I wasn't lucky like you. And I'm like, luck had nothing to do with it. There's no luck. I just put in a lot more time and I was willing to pay prices that you were not willing to pay. Exactly. It. Exactly. It. Yeah, no, you nailed it. I, I I really have very little I could even comment on that, but everything you just said is exactly what it takes. And, and you call it the marathon. I mean, in life, folks, life is a marathon and, you know, building your business, building your wealth, building the, the dream, your dream, it's a marathon. And I, 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 I'm sad to say it. And you've seen it so many times. You mentioned it with the people coasting. We all know the coasters and we know a lot of them in the masterminds that we're in, you know, I, I could literally go in and be like, you're coasting, you're coasting, you're coasting, you're back on the way down. You're crushing it, but you are crushing it because you are creating, you're just never stopped creating. And, And I think there's not a good or bad, you know, I'm not saying anything bad about the coasters, but just realize like they've arrived at their level of success they want to be, but just know when you have arrived, the only way to go is back down. <clears throat> and the other thing that's uh, that's really interesting is how you just keep creating everything that you're doing, but you do it with such positive energy. When you're at the masterminds, you just have this energy and energy is is contagious and, and people can really see it. And it just attracts people to you. I, I've seen this over and over, not just at family, but also at boardroom. Like you just bring an energy and that energy is contagious. And it also is something everybody wants and they want a piece of it. They don't know why they want it. They don't know what they want. But they want that. And I think if you just keep with that positive mental energy and that positive mental attitude, you're unstoppable. Thanks, you're unstoppable. Man. Thanks. Yeah. I, I appreciate it. You know, uh, I always, I, I made a video about this the other day because I think it's, it resonates so well, but um, it's something as simple as, and I'm sure you've encountered this, but you know, you ever talk to somebody and you say what's up to them or, Hey, well, Hey, what's going on? And then immediately what comes out of their mouth is like, same shit, different day. And I'm just like, why would you say that? <laughs> I'm just thinking to myself, like, I'm like, what? even if your day is shit, fine. I probably you used to say that. I, I bet you any money. I, I used to say that in Wall Street. I used to say the same it. shit. And yeah, I, I used to be like, all oh, the time. Yeah, same shit, different toilet. And I'm like, do you think anyone wants to be around you when you say that? No, no one wants to be around you. People actually, you repel anything good that might have come out of that. So what you know, what I say is, listen, I don't, first of all, big mindset shift in the last 18 months. I don't believe in bad days anymore. There's no such thing as a bad day. There's bad moments within a day. And even then, they're changeable at any moment in time. Now, of course, to anybody watching me, it's easier said than done. This is a this is a thing like a muscle. If you go to the gym or if you work out or if you do anything physical, you know the more you do it, the easier it becomes. It sucks when you're first getting into it, right? When I got onto my fitness journey three years ago, I was like a little T Rex walking around sore all the time. Now I can go to the gym six days a week, no problem. But I'm consistent with it, right? I'm consistent with my diet. But again, just think about what it is that you want. Nobody cares that your life is sucking right now. It's harsh to say, no one cares. As a matter of fact, you shouldn't care that much. You shouldn't. You should figure out, well, I don't have what I want, but how can I have what I want? Who has what I want? How can I go get that? And when you identify that person, like I did early on in my career, like I still do to this day, how can I pour massive amount of value into that individual? I don't care how, 
It might not be monetary. People who have money, typically speaking, they're not looking for more of it. Of course, they want to make more money, but you're not going to change their life by being like, hey, I can make you a lot more money. They're going to be like, all right, great. You and 10 other guys, right? Exactly. That's not the point. Find what, what that person values. Find what that person can identify with and then add it. That's how you get a relationship. That's, you know, you have to really give, 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 and then give some more. And then you'll, the universe returns it, you know, in a hundred X, you know, fold. But I think when people do that, I had a student who, um, he's amazing. He approached me just the same way that, uh, Dimitri, I think it was approached you, right? He, I spoke at an event over a year ago, got off stage, boom, he was right in my face. And he's, you know, young guy, 25 at the time. And he's like, hey man, um, how are you? And I'm like, hey, how's it going? And, and you know, we're talking and you know, I'm like, all right, you're in my face now. <laughs> and the guy's just like, he's like, look, man, um, I don't, I don't have the money for the mentorship. However, I do have this deal and I've heard all your podcasts and I want to add value to you. Could you take a look at the deal and maybe we can work something out? And I said, okay, cool. Let's talk tomorrow. Look, fast forward, just to, to, to get to the meat and potatoes here for everybody. That kid and I ended up working together for a year. He ended up making seven figures in his wholesale business. He ended up getting out of $200,000 in debt from a prior business. And that one deal made me 120 grand and made him a considerable amount of money. But more importantly than money, he earned my time, my respect, and my attention forever. Virtually, we still talk. We, I still help him on deals where he needs to, but he's pretty self sufficient now. And he comes from a single mom. I mean, the story was very similar first generation, cute, you know, all these things. And but the kid did it the right way, the right way. And people look at him now and they're like, oh man, he crushed it. And I'm like, because he wanted to. And he and he listened to everything I said. He didn't stop. He didn't ask, is it left? Is it right? He just went. And he was bought in. And also he started by leading with value, which is the most important thing. He led with value. He didn't say, hey, could I pick your brain over coffee? He didn't say that because he was never going to get my attention. And by the way, anyone who's listening, if there's someone that you perceive that you want a relationship with, for the love of Christ, don't ever ask them, could I pick your brain? Could I take you to coffee? It is 100,000% disrespectful of that person's time and it is disrespectful for yourself and you're not going to make it anywhere with that kind of attitude. If someone asks me that, my answer is, is a very standard answer. No, you may not. That's, that's it. And then what they say next is going to determine whether we're ever going to talk again. I mean, that's, you're right. It is disrespectful. May I pick your brain? Just think about that, folks. Think about how you'd react if somebody asked you that. You know, it's it's like, one thing you said, Will, and, and I want to give this to the audience, you know, a lot of times people see people that are wealthy, they're successful, people like Will, people like myself and, and other successful individuals. And they're always trying to find like an angle of like, how do I work with them? Almost always, if you can put time back in that person's life, time is the single common denominator among all successful people. It's not money anymore. Like, you're not going to motivate me saying you're going to make me more money. I'm like, I already make millions of dollars. I already have all the things I want. Like, I, I don't have time to sh have you show me how you're going to make me more money. I already know how to do that. But yeah. if you can come to me and you can show me how you can buy my time back through your efforts, you've got my immediate attention. I am yours. I am putty. I'm like cash the cat right here. I am your, I, I, I want to know what you can do. How are you going to give me my time back? Because yeah. time is the single most precious resource we all have. Successful people just happen to really hone in on this because they understand its value. Because most, a lot of so many people, you know, I call them the 95 percenters, they haven't valued time yet because they're so used to just trading time for money, time for money. So the value they put on their time is literally the hour, the amount that they get paid per hour. But the more successful you get, you start your time is you can't put a value on it. There is no amount of money my time is worth. So you want to really hit a successful person where it matters. It's time 100% of the time. 100%, 100%. And, and, you know, again, going back to the concept of time and all that, uh, I'm making a series of videos right now in English and Spanish, um, which is a really simple exercise, but I'm, I'm actually documenting my life and how I value time and um, what I do with my time. Right. And 
It's very simple. Take the last 12 months of your income, right? And whatever it is, it doesn't really matter. Then boil it down to how many hours you, you worked. Could be round figures, but how many hours do you think you worked to get that money? And then divide it, right? And average out, okay, this is what my time is worth per hour. Let's say it's 200 bucks an hour. Let's just say it's 200 bucks an hour. Anything that falls below something that you can pay somebody else to do for less than $200 an hour, you are now going to delegate and outsource outside of family obligations and things that require you to be there, which you should be there too. But outside of that, everything. And what do I mean by this? A very simple example. I used to wash my car, not me, but I used to drive to a car wash go there. It was 45 minutes, probably an hour with the commute and back and forth and sit there and all the stupid shit. And I used to be like, oh yeah, it's 30 bucks. It's great. And then one day I thought about it. I'm like, man, I'm averaging about 400 bucks an hour right now based on last year. What the hell am I doing? Driving my own car to go get car wash, risking an accident, whatever the hell else or traffic and all the anxiety and stopping everything I'm doing to go do that. What am I doing with my time? So now I have a guy pay 400 bucks a month. He comes here once a week, takes my car out of the garage, does his thing, does my girlfriend's car too. And it's perfect. And it's, it, my assistant handles, he's on auto pay, the whole thing, right? And I've done that, you know, with cleaning people for my house, which I'm very grateful for. Laundry. I mean, the list goes on and on and on. Travel. Again, I don't travel if it's not first class. It's not because I'm arrogant. It's not because I'm a dick. It's because I don't want to sit in coach and listen to the bullshit that people in coach talk about. Well, we don't have a free blanket. Well, we're, we used to get free drinks. I don't give a shit about that. I'd rather ride in first class, maybe meet a guy like Chris, talk about, hey, what do you do? Hey, what do you do? Well, clearly you value your time if you paid 1500 bucks for this seat. You value your time because you're boarding priority. You value your time because you don't have to check in a goddamn bag. You value it because it's a free bag and you don't get hassled. So you obviously do something that I may be interested in. I've met lenders on planes. And I'm just talking. Older guys. And they're like, hey, I see you wearing a Rolex. I'm wearing a Rolex. We're talking now. Blah, 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 blah. What do you do? Oh, that's great. That's real estate. Oh, that's awesome. Always wanted to, you know, get into real estate. Oh, that's great. Well, yeah, I retired. I got an IRA with $3 million. Not really doing anything with it. I mean, what a great opportunity, right? So Success leaves clues. If you value your time and you start actually, and it's uncomfortable at first, the mastermind concept is a really great way to look at it. The first time I joined a mastermind, it was 30 grand a year. I almost shit my pants because I was like, oh my God, I cannot believe I'm about to pay $30,000 a year to be in a room a couple times a year with people. But then you get there and you realize you're like, oh, I'm not paying for the people that are in the room. I'm really paying for the people that are not in the room. Yep. That aren't valuing that time. So when you do that, man, I mean, I couldn't tell you, man, I've been a part of masterminds now for over five years. My greatest relationships, friendships, business opportunities have all come out of masterminds because we're all there for a common goal. And of course, you know, you have idiots everywhere, but again, for the majority, you, you just have a common mindset goal. I know you're valuing your time. I know you're obviously doing well enough if you're paying 50, 60 grand for education. And again, I don't, I have budgets for a lot of things. I don't have a budget for education, self-growth. I have elasticity infinitely for that budget because I don't think you could ever get enough. And, and the biggest, the biggest jumps in my life, financially, physically, mentally, spiritually, whatever, have been because of exposing myself to different environments like Tony Robbins, like masterminds, ex experiences. Those things will change your life forever and the people you meet. I love it, man. And Steve Harvey says, says it best regarding first class. Once you upgrade your life, why would you ever go back down? And, you know, I, you know, just, I'm sure you get it with your family, but you know, we'll be talking to my family and they're like, wait, you have somebody that comes in and, you know, just you pay just to be at your house and do whatever you don't want to do, whether it's cleaning or, you know, we have a cleaner too, but then they have somebody. Yeah. Why? Like that stuff you could do yourself. You don't value your time. Like, and, and it's always the same thing. And you just sort of have to just kind of brush it off because they're not going to understand it ever. Why don't, don't you mow your own lawn? Like, like, you, will you pay somebody? How much did that? How come you didn't weed the, 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 you know, landscaping in your office? Why did you pay somebody that like, is beautiful outside? You could have done it yourself. You don't understand. You don't value your time, but, but don't try to help people understand their no. journeys, their journey. They'll figure it out or maybe they won't. 
every single one of us have to be on our own journey, chasing our own goals and dreams. And so many people that you'll come across throughout your life will be what we call the people that conform, the 95%, because they just conform to what other people say they should do. And they mm -hmm. don't even know why they conform to that. But Will, with that being said, as we get to the end of this, how would people learn more about what you do? I know I gave them, you know, your Instagram and your website, but like, what is the best place for people to connect with you? Yeah. So Instagram is my heaviest platform. Um, I, I'm very active on there. My team is very active on there too. So at Willie numbers, W-I-L-L-Y, and then the, the word numbers, um, that's where you can find everything. I put out a ton of content in English and Spanish. Now we're really ramping up more into the Spanish side. It's probably going to be 70, 30, 80, 20 on the Spanish side. Um, WillieNumbers.com is, is the main website. If you want a JV with us, there's a link there as well. If you have a deal in South Florida or anything like that. Right now, we're only JVing in the Florida markets, um, primarily the South Florida market. Um, that That's the best place to, to get a hold of me, man. Uh, either Instagram or we are on TikTok and YouTube and all that stuff. But my heaviest platform is Instagram. Love it, folks. We'll put that in the description. So if you didn't catch that, you can just go right into the description of this episode, click it and connect with it, with Will and his team. But th this has been fire, folks. Like there's been so many nuggets that you've gotten from this podcast. I'm just hoping you take one or two of them and run with them and apply them in your life. And, and I hope a few of these things that you just learned or heard, can you can relate back to your life and be like, oh, that's why. Because sometimes it's just that clarity. Sometimes it's just understanding why something is the way it is, that that's all you needed to get past that, that thing that's that anchor that's been holding you down. And I think this episode has been really, really valuable from that standpoint. So folks, connect with Will and his team. Get out there and just march to the beat of your own drum. Chase your dream. Stop listening to people. Stop conforming to what other people tell you life should look like and your life should be. It's your life. Go get it. Thanks for joining us for another episode. Will, what an honor. Thanks for coming on. I appreciate you, man. It was my honor. Thank you. All right, folks. We'll catch you on the next one.